everything you wanted to ask about Low Power FM, Applicant Support Question and Answer Session. Uh, that's coming up next Monday, September 23rd at 6 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, following that, in the same week, we'll have free software for community radio. Uh, and that's going to happen, uh, Wednesday, September 25th at 6 p.m. Eastern Time. And we'll also have uh, a training the following Tuesday, that's October 1st. That's, um, that's actually at 1 p.m. Uh, and that one is called Locally Sourced News, How to Build a Volunteer News Department. Uh, and you can um, check out our website, prometheusradio.org slash webinars to see the other upcoming trainings. Uh, and also you can check out our uh, training archives, prometheusradio.org slash archives, and that will have this recording, or this webinar, sorry, recorded, as well as uh, all the ones that have been happening uh, in the last month or so uh, that, are, that we're doing towards applicant support uh, leading up to the window, and, uh, and also older trainings as well that you can access there. Uh, I just want to give everyone a little background about uh, Prometheus. I know that there are some folks on the line I recognize from doing a few of these now, but we like to just do a little intro about Prometheus and about community radio in general. Prometheus is a not-for-profit based in Philadelphia, and we've been around for about 15 years doing work to build participatory radio as a voice for community expression and a tool for social justice organizing. We exist to counter corporate consolidation and control of the media. Over time, the media has become less and less accessible to communities as corporations have acquired a bigger share of the media landscape. It is not in the interest of this small handful of corporations to effectively represent, celebrate, and affirm the varied communities that we are all a part of. We need our own media outlets to tell our visions of history, to make our own news that combats stereotypes and speaks truth to power, and to create positive changes in our own communities. For the past 13 years, Prometheus has helped hundreds of communities start their own radio stations. Today, there's over 800 low-power FM stations on the air, and this fall, many new channels are becoming available across the nation. This is an opportunity for communities to own their own media infrastructure through starting low-power community radio stations. By community radio, we mean transformative for both listeners and media makers, participatory, as in democratically organized with community involvement in the production of content, and affordable and accessible stations with multimedia capabilities that are locally rooted. We here at Prometheus are on the ground in communities across the country working with grassroots groups just like the ones many of you joining us tonight are a part of. We want to use the media to create a more democratic society, and these trainings are part of our strategy to promote participatory radio as a part of building that society. Please consider supporting Prometheus where your financial support today means a better media future. And you can visit our website to support our work, prometheusradio.org slash donate. Um, just want to go over some of the goals for the uh, webinar tonight. Of course, we're building a broadcast and production studio. We want to learn about basic studio setup, and we want to review standard audio and transmission equipment. Of course, before you put your low power FM station on the air, you'll have to make a lot of decisions related to equipment. And this training is intended to help you figure out what components you need for a station and what features to look for in those components. Uh, tonight we have two guest speakers with us. We have Will Floyd, who is a musician and audio recording enthusiast who has served in several roles at WOBC, the student-run radio station in Oberlin, Ohio. Uh, and that includes uh, jobs as engineer and general manager. Will currently works with us here at Prometheus as a technical and training organizer, performing engineering studies, and educating about the mechanics of community radio. Uh, we also have joining us tonight Donna DiBianco, who is based in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Donna's 20 years of experience starting and running non-commercial and community radio stations brings the experience and knowledge uh, any startup station needs. A strong operations organizer, Donna teaches basic show, basic show hosting to FCC filings, reports, and compliance. So both of these folks, I'm super excited to have them with us tonight who can go over the basics of what we're going to need to get a station started. Uh, I'm going to pass it over to uh, Will and Donna, we're going to go through, um, I guess, some of the information we have in uh, an equipment guide that Will's going to talk about um, that he put together, and then move through all the pieces. Of course, you can ask questions at any time in the chat box uh, that I'll um, kind of get together so that after the presentation we can go through people's questions about particular gear or about how they come together or that kind of thing. So I'll pass it over to Will. <laughs>
All right. Um, the first thing to check out is the, um, the document that's called Low Power FM Radio Equipment Guide, um, which you can find on the Prometheus Radio uh, website. Um, and you can see the uh, prometheusradio.org slash studio. Um, the link is in there, and there's some more information about studio equipment. Um, so, uh, you know, we're going to be talking about a lot of the, the content that's in the equipment guide um, tonight and um, in addition to some other things. But um, there's, there's going to be more information in the equipment guide than we can possibly get to um, during this webinar. So um, I would highly recommend um, taking a look at that document um, uh, just to get started. All right, so here's a, a pretty big um, little chart of, of all the components um, in a radio uh, setup. Um, this is from WRFU, uh, Low Power Station. Um, and we're going to cover um, probably, as, I mean, as much as we can um, and focus on the studio uh, portion of the uh, equipment um, rather than too much of the transmitter stuff. Um, but um, obviously there are kind of two, two parts uh, that make a whole. Um, you need the, the studio um, section, uh, you know, with your mixer and your um, audio inputs like microphones and turntables and CD players um, and all that kind of stuff in order to uh, feed uh, your program, produce your program, and feed it to the transmitter and antenna. So um, that would be, uh, yeah, that would be something to keep in mind. Um, the other thing is, is that um, there are kind of two different um, uh, audio setups that you might find at any given radio station. One is uh, kind of a broadcast. Um, live uh, studio that um, serves as kind of the epicenter of, of programming and um, usually directly feeds the transmitter line um, and is kind of the last stop for all audio uh, before um, it goes onto the air. Um, the other kind of studio that you might find um, in a uh, radio station is a production studio, and that's going to have a lot of the same equipment as your main studio, but um, not not um, a lot of the broadcast equipment. Now, the the two different roles of those two different studios, um, a production studio is a place where you know um, folks who are working on pre-recorded radio shows or um, small spots you know, uh, station IDs or um, underwriting kind of spots, um, public service announcements, um, or, um, you know, uh, music um, perhaps, um, recorded music. Th uh, they're going to often work on that in a production studio um, with a computer and an editing software possibly some, some inputs like a microphone that goes to a mixer and then goes into a computer. The thing that the production studio doesn't have are, um, it do, well, first of all, it doesn't have a direct line often to the transmitter. So anything that you make in a production studio has to be um, you know, transferred to the broadcast studio in order to, to get it on the air. Um, and it doesn't have things like an emergency alert system machine. Um, or, uh, you know, tra uh, controls for the transmitter, perhaps. Um, so those are the kinds of things that, um, you know, the production studio does have um, the ability to produce uh, pre-recorded material. Here is uh, in, in the, uh, a, a drawing of a studio, a, a broadcast studio, it's found in the equipment guide. And you can see in the center, uh, there's a seat for the host. 
um, and uh, the host has a microphone in front of them and the main uh, broadcast board. Often, especially in uh, you know community radio stations um, nowadays, the host is also the engineer um, during the show. Um, so the host is also the person raising the, um, the levels of the mics and making sure everyone can be heard, putting uh, callers on the air. Um, and um, you know, it, uh, especially um, in the past, um, that might might have been uh, those functions might have been filled by two different people. Someone who's like uh, an engineer who's um, running the board, and then someone who's the, the main host. But um, it works pretty well to have um, one person kind of running the show, um, hosting and dealing with the board. And then you can see you can have uh, guest speakers, as well as um, you'll see on the host's left um, some turntables and uh, an equipment rack where there's likely uh, CD players and, and the like, um, where the host can put on uh, sounds and music um, during the show. Um, and you also notice that um, setup is pretty important. You got uh, um, a table um, where you can uh, both run the board and uh, put on uh, music as well as uh, talk directly to guests, so that's pretty important. All right, um, Donna, uh, yes. do you have any any thoughts or comments on that? And if not, maybe we can do a little presentation? Well, yes, uh, I, I, I would like to add that um, when you're choosing your studio design that U shape, um, one of the things you're going to want to be sure is that you have enough clearance down below underneath because that's generally where your transmitting equipment is going to be and your monitors will be. Um, <clears throat> they're usually down below, out of sight, um, so people can't, uh, you know, fiddle with it, or raise power or low power um, by accident. That would be the only thing I would add to this studio design. Hello? Hi. Um, okay. Do you want to kind of go over some of the stuff that's in yours? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I will have to do this manually because I am not actually in the... Um, yeah, I, I can do the slides. The um, I'll do okay, so let's, um, let's pull up the uh, um, guide the gear guide. I'm sorry, I can't see what, what you're putting up. Um, but the, the second part of uh, the uh, slideshow that I have, uh, that pretty much the second part of that slideshow uh, would be based pretty much underneath except for the, um, of course, the mast and the, the antennas going outside. Uh, but most of that equipment you want down below or up and out of the way. Um, so uh, it can't be it can't be handled unless it's handled with intent, I guess is the best way to put it. Are there any questions on that? Yeah, it looks like there aren't there aren't many questions there, so we can keep uh, moving along. Did you want to look at um, talk about anything else that there was a part of your slideshow, Donna? Or um, yeah, let me uh, let me call up my slideshow real quick. No okay. one really here. Yeah, and of course, like I said earlier, folks can at any time just uh, pop questions into the chat box, and I can either relay those to our speakers as we go, or again, keep them for the end when we'll have a little uh, Q&A sort of catch up for things that you missed or other uh, questions that you have. Uh, and you can either send those, open, put them open on the chat box or send them to us as the presenters, and then we can just take a look at them. 
And uh, again, I just want to stress, and I'll put it in the box for folks, is that there is a Prometheus does have a low power um, FM equipment guide, and that that's a really um, helpful tool for kind of navigating all the pieces that you need, and uh, and taking a look at where you can get stuff like that, and you know names of equipment beyond just uh, beyond just like a general idea, so that you have a good sense of what you'll need. And then I see that there is a question here about um, looking at streaming, and we are going to talk about that uh, after we go a little yeah. bit further into some of the uh, equipment stuff, and we'll actually we'll actually do a little screen share so that we can show folks where the information is about that on the Prometheus website as well, and I think Donna can definitely speak to that, and of course Will as well, so we'll, we'll do some sharing uh, people's experience with doing that at different stations. So, um, Donna, are you, do you want, are you? Yeah, I am ready. If we can jump to the basic transmission system on that slideshow. Sure. Yeah, definitely. All right. Okay. So that Sage, di that Sage Digital Index yeah. is something that um, you want to have um, set up in a rack, uh, preferably uh, as close to the, the board as possible, um, because sometimes uh, you need to. All your DJs will be able to will need to be able to operate that. Uh, but not as on a regular momentarily basis. So you can either set that up high uh, on a wall, mounted to a wall, or you can um, uh, have it in a rack underneath that main studio, along with your voice processor, which is the next uh, screen. Yep. Your voice processors, as well as the um, now the transmitter and the exciter can be done one of two ways. Um, that can be separated out um, to a closet, depending on the environment that you're going to be setting up the station in. Um, either that can be put into a closet uh, elsewhere, which is not a bad idea because generally you don't want people to mess with the transmitter and the exciter. Um, Usually, that's a straight shot from the closet to the antenna and the mast that will run up the side of the building or out of the studio. Um, and depending on how you plan on doing your broadcasting, whether it's going to be just a hardwired line all the way up on the side of a building, uh, or if you're going to send that uh, over a uh, uh, ISP, uh, a studio transmitter link, um, all of those those pieces of gear should be locked away somewhere. And Donna, there was a question about um, if every studio needs uh, an encoder decoder. Maybe you want to cover uh, that. They are they are required to low power FM stations are required to. Um, only be able to uh, retransmit, uh, and uh, they need to be able to monitor and retransmit any emergency codes. Um, now, the thing is, is that the investment that you're going to make in the decoder um, is almost comparable to an encoder decoder. Uh, so you may want to shop around. Uh, while I was looking around today, I saw um, them being pretty much basically the same price. Uh, so it might be wise to take a look at the Sage uh, and see if uh, you can get a refurbished uh, NDEC, as we call them. Uh, uh, you might be able to get a refurbished at a much reasonable rate, and that will be just fine. That will keep you in compliance. No, you're not technically required to originate uh, tests, um, but you should be able to monitor them and retransmit them if necessary. So That's part of this. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Um, um, yeah, and so uh, Barry is asking about what the function of the encoder decoder is. And that's, a, that's your emergency alert system uh, encoder and decoder. What that means is it's receiving emergency alert messages and then sending them back out. Um, and like Donna was saying, it, uh, low power FM, the FCC uh, does not require you to encode and send out emergency alert messages 
And I think they did that because they were trying to uh, reduce the burden on low power FM, but um, it doesn't seem as if uh, low power FM um, specific, there's not many um, only decoder um, machines right. like Don are not that much less money than the than the encoder decoder. So that's that's why that that exists like that. Exactly, and I highly highly recommend the Sages. Um, they're easy to work with. Their support team is incredible. Uh, and like I said, uh, you might be able to find refurbished uh, uh, Sage Index uh, at a much much reasonable, much more reasonable price uh, than just a straight decoder. Great. Um, um, Barry, to a answer maybe your earlier question um, about digital uh, digital streaming. Um, in this in this uh, example that um, Donna has here, um, this uh, this chart, you can see that after the audio console goes to the signal processing equipment, it goes to the transmitter. If you're broadcasting online, um, at that point it would also go to a computer or a, a, um, like a in-stream or extreme or barracks box or some sort of, uh, it's a, you know, another kind of encoder to get it onto the, the web. Um, that's usually standard. Have you seen it done other ways, Donna? Um, that is pretty much the standard that I've seen. Uh, uh, there might be some other ways to uh, do that, um, but that's pretty much the standard. That's the standard is is that they put it upstream uh, just before it goes out uh, to the transmitter. All right. Well, um, maybe we since we're talking about it, we can move on to talk about uh, internet streaming. Okay. And I will get to the internet streaming page. So give me just one second. All right, um, so here is um, the internet streaming page on prometheusradio.org. Um, great. Um, so one of the one of the good tools on this site which um, you may not have heard about, um, is this key to internet radio um, tool. So if you go to the what do you need for internet streaming page and go to the key to internet radio or click on the image, you get to this page. This will help you figure out how to get started streaming your, um, your audio um, program. So I just went to the wizard. And then it asks you a series of questions in order to determine what kind of setup would best be, best work for you in your situation. Here it asks me what sort of I know about. It 
here it asks me um, if I'm comfortable handling content licensing of our stream on, on our own or if I need to pay someone else to handle this. Donna, do you want to talk about content licensing a little bit? Right. Okay, so there is some content licensing that you'll have to be aware of, especially when you um, start out uh, streaming, and the big one is the sound exchange. Um, the beautiful part about hiring or becoming a member of certain groups and organizations that, that cover the sound exchange reporting for you is that uh, generally your workload is much more limited. Uh, you, don't have to, uh, you don't have to worry about the monthly reporting that needs to be done. It will be done automatically um, through your uh, through your uh, content manager, uh, you know whatever pro whatever program you're using uh, to broadcast out over the air. Uh, generally, we'll track all of that for you and then report it to the group um, to report to Sound Exchange. Uh, doing it independently is is is. It, you can do it, but um, the fees uh, vary, and so you want to find groups where uh, you can do a group buy of the licensing fees, and that way you can reduce it. I know the uh, National Federation of Community Broadcasters, NFCB, has a great uh, group buy on licensing. Uh, their membership is uh, pretty inexpensive. Uh, and it includes not only um, a licensing for the internet station, but pretty much uh, terrestrial broadcasting topics are covered uh, through their listservs as well as through their um, web pages. Uh, some pretty important things that are needed at that point is uh, um, you know, getting that kind of coverage so you can start broadcasting at least on the internet right away. Any questions on that? All right. So also, we're on the next question here, which is: uh, Is the station going to be um, using? A web server hosted off the premises. Um, so often that'll be um, a host like Streamhost or I don't know Linode. I'm not sure what that is, um, or GoDaddy or something like that. Right, right. Yeah, generally, um, when you're looking for building your your web page. Uh, there are some combinations where you can get the streaming uh, included in in the web page, uh, which is something that you you want to work with either if you're using Mac equipment, then it'd be like Nicecast, uh, Shoutcast. Um, if you're using Linux, it'll be uh, uh, Internet DJ. Uh, or a multi-platform combination of equipment, uh, you get into a mix, M-I-X-X-X, which is further down on that guide page. Great. And I'm, I'm kind of just uh, speeding through this wizard um, to see what the show, what the result looks like, because you can um, do uh, go through this wizard on your own to kind of have a have an idea of what works best for you. Right now, there are some free hosting services. If there's questions about, um, it is on the Prometheus page. Uh, um, there's GISS.TV, uh, FreeStreamHosting.org, and Capture.FM. And then for Spanish language programming, um, there is a website called Flujos, F-L-U-J-O-S dot org website. It's uh, Spanish language streaming resources. Um, that's a software program as well. So, so there's there's plenty of opportunities um, 
to begin this. And again, the the internet streaming. My recommendation is is that you you begin that the day you're granted the construction permit and you've reserved your call letters. As soon as you've reserved your call letters, uh, you can. I would recommend start branding your web page and everything right then and there. Uh, if you're already beginning to stream now with the name of the project, uh, you can keep that uh, going. You can do it with the name of the radio project, um, but you cannot use call letters until they are uh, secured and reserved and granted to you. I think that's a great great idea, um, and that definitely help you get started um, so that when you're on ready to go on the air, you're uh, already running a, a tight ship. Right. Well, and, and the beautiful part of it is, is, is that you get the opportunity to understand what broadcasting 24-7 is. You get to understand how um, your broadcast day is going to sound. Uh, you're going to learn about the multiple volunteers that will be coming in and approaching about doing radio shows, uh, how to get them trained, uh, how to get them organized uh, in, in making sense of a show clock and everything else that needs to happen. Um, so it's a real good opportunity um, to, it's almost like an instant gratification basically, uh, you've got this radio project, uh, you've applied for the application, you've been granted the construction permit. Now you can go on the air, quote, quote, um, through, the, you know, through the streaming and, and start raising money to get the equipment that you want and need. Uh, the transmitters are not cheap. The EAS systems are not cheap. So, so there's the avenue that you can start making revenue right of way you can keep tabs on the project um, through the day-to-day -day operation of the streaming station. All right. Um, I think maybe we should move on. Um, okay. So that's a, that's a bit about internet streaming. And again, you can find um, this cool uh, this tool. Key to Internet on the internet streaming page at prometheusradio.org. And there's also some links there to the um, information that uh, Donna was just talking about um, different programs like Nicecast, um, Mix. Um, so, and there's also some, some free hosting things. And the next thing I think. To talk about is is um, how to um, actually go out and, and look at equipment and buy it. Um, there's all different kinds of um, um, equipment. Um, online retailers who specialize in different types of equipment. Um, so, um, here I'm looking at the um, Equipment guide. Um, this is the microphone section, um, and you can see all these different kinds of microphones. There's the description and the price. So, say if we took the um, one of these guys, and we're trying to at the end of the equipment guide document, all the way at the end, there's a source page. Um, and there's different kinds of uh, um, retailers who specialize in different things, like I was saying. Um, so the kind of studio equipment, audio type gear, um, there's um, some these two um, sources. Um, there's broadcast specialty um, folks who, like BW and Broadcast Depot. Um, and you can find them at these locations. Um, then there's tower, um, tower uh, components and masks and things, um, and then kind of other other kinds of um, specific broadcast type of of things. Um, 
Is there anything, Donna, that you've had experience with, any of these retailers? or? Oh, yes. Um, Broadcast Supply Worldwide, uh, based out of Tacoma, Washington, uh, is uh, <clears throat> probably one of the bigger supply uh, organizations and companies in, in the nation. Uh, they are uh, quick turnarounds. Um, they have some great package deals. And um, the other part that I really like about BSW is that they also not only do they sell the top of the line stuff, but they also have um, B stock, uh, C stock, and refurbished stock. And so there's a way to get another, uh, you know, a better deal um, with the re if you if you have an engineer um, that you're working with who knows what uh, what equipment is needed. Um, you can work with them through uh, BSW. Uh, I love their combination packages. I just saw a microphone package that would be great for studios, it's like a five pack of microphones. Um, that would be great for interviewing um, for like a hundred dollars. So you can find some really good deals there. Uh, also, the broadcast uh, warehouse is a good one. Uh, they also have deals, and um, that's where you can look and find some real comparable equipment. Now, if you are doing this work on your own, um, there are some things that you really need to be mindful of, uh, especially when it comes to your transmitters, is that they do, they must be FCC certified. I uh, was doing some research on some transmitters, and found this one organization. I thought, wow, this is really good, too good to be true. And I had a few engineer buddies take a look at it. And their response was, don't touch it with a 10-foot pole because it's not FCC cleared. So when you get to that level of finding a transmitter, that's the biggest investment. The transmitter, your mast, and your antennas are going to be your biggest investment. And you want to have not only FCC approved, uh, but equipment that's going to last you a while. So um, the people you want to you want to look at there is like Broadcasters General, uh, RF Special is a good place to take a look at at transmitting uh, equipment and gear. Great, um, and here. There are, um, this is a screenshot from the equipment guide. Um, at the end, there are, um, di uh, with different levels of, of equipment um, for, um, for your studio and for um, your transmitter equipment. So here, this is a setup. Um, it's labeled moderate setup um, because, you know, if you were a commercial radio station or a NPR station or something with a big budget, um, you'd probably spend a few times this amount for your studio. But um, this is in the equipment guide. This is like the high, the high end. <laughs> so um, this has uh, examples of of all of um, the things you might want to put in your studio, and it comes out to around fifteen thousand um, dollars. The minimal setup comes to about five, and this is if you're getting um, B stock and C stock, like Donna was saying, or if you are um, getting donations of old computers um, and use a uh, used, you know, FM tuner and speakers, um, you can really get the price down um, and um, to, to you know a third of the of the one we just saw, um, and the same goes for transmission equipment. Um, this here is the, the, the more decked out uh, version of the transmitter equipment. And um, it includes a, a transmitter that's um, you know, web connected, um, so you can access its controls anywhere, um, a high-end audio processor um, so that uh, your 
broadcast sounds consistent and you're within legal modulation limits. Um, and a two-bay antenna, which is um, an antenna that gives you more gain so you can turn down your power um, and have the same coverage area. And then um, the minimal setup is um, about half of that. Um, so you're using a, a much cheaper audio processor that's a, a compressor with a peak limiter um, that keeps your um, transmission legal, but it might not sound quite as smooth and nice as the high-end processor. Um, same thing for a transmitter and a, a one-bay antenna and so on. Um, right. Yeah. I'd, I'd like to take a moment at, the, at this time just to make it clear that all of this is, um, can be bought in parts. That's the other thing. Um, I, it, it was that you know $14,000 price tag. Um, you will have 18 months to raise that kind of money. And, and technically what you want from the, from the day of the grant of the construction permit, you want to have about half of that year all ready to go so you can start streaming. So between now and you know the the award, um, you're going to want to start asking you know your your ten favorite friends to um, uh, contribute about you know a hundred dollars, two hundred dollars a piece, whatever they can, so you can at least begin acquiring the basic studio equipment with a web streaming capability, um, and then as soon as that construction permit is granted, that's when you can, you know, fire it up, um, fire up the radio project and really start raising the remaining seven, eight, ten thousand dollars that you might need in order to acquire um, the transmitter, the exciters, the antennas, the masts, um, get you know, get the, the finances together for renting a transmitter space or, or uh, you know, tower site um, or the expenses of building your own tower site. Um, so it, it, I, I just want to take the sticker shock out <laughs> because people are like, oh, my gosh, you do have time to, do, to raise that funding. All right, well, um, I think maybe this would be a good time for questions unless there's anything else, uh, Donna, that you want to cover before we go there? No, I think that's a good, I think that's a good point. We should go to questions. Great. Yeah, so folks, again, just to remind people that uh, you can use the chat box to send us a couple questions. We'll see what we can do. One question I'm going to open up with, just because there's none in there, um, is related but is about um, portable equipment, if you guys can speak to that um, quickly, I guess. I know that there, that opens kind of a whole other can of worms in some ways, but um, a big piece of the station that I worked at was being able to go out and um, collect interviews or field recordings for production pieces back in the studio, and I'm just wondering if, if both of you maybe want to talk about your favorite, um, both maybe microphones and recording devices for being out in the field. Donna, you feel free to go first. Go ahead, Will. All right. Um, one of um, one one um, version uh, of is the is the Zoom line of of um, portable recorders, and they have several different um, uh, kind of uh, levels. Um, but um, that's a popular one. The Zoom H2 is a pretty popular, um, low-cost, um, and pretty high-functioning uh, uh, portable recorder. Um, it has a different mic. It has four different mics in it that can be set up in different ways um, to to capture um, audio. Um, and it's it's a uh, you know, it, its functions are very high. You know, like a high level of, of functionality. Um, it 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 feels a little bit cheap, and I think where they they kind of get the price down is the uh, you know the enclosure and whatnot. It's made out of like plastic, but um, you can get a case for it, and it, it works really well. Um, 
yeah, there's some other some other ones um, that are I'm blanking on right now that I that I like a lot uh, that are a little higher end, but um, um, yeah, the Zoom line, um, which is a it's a subsidiary of Samson, um, is 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 one that I've used and liked. I like the um, uh, Tascam has another nice uh, handheld recorder um, that comes with a, a bi-directional um, microphone pickup system um, that keeps everything digitally stored, which makes it very easy for you to walk in and do a, even your own computer at home uh, to edit if you have the right gear. Um, but let me see. I'm, I'm looking it up right now. That works very well. Uh, um, another... Hello? Go ahead. Um, another another um, one that works pretty well um, is the uh, the Marantz, um I think it's like PMD line um, or PM or something. Um, that's a, a a little bit more high quality one that um, is, has been pretty popular in the past with uh, radio interviews. Um, okay. Are there any other questions? Yeah. Out there? So there's a question from Barry about um, studio transmitter links um, via. Um, Telco phone line, um, and the thing that I would say to, to that is um, the kind of um, old school landline um, uh, studio transmitter links are are kind of out of favor. Um, they're expensive and not very high quality, um, and in fact, most um, kind of especially LPFMs that go on the air. Um, and and you know and even uh, FM translators and smaller FM stations um, use often use um, uh, wireless technology specifically in the unlicensed band um, you know the the uh, kind of the what is the Wi-Fi band um, of of uh, studio transmitter links um, and so yeah that's that's uh, they all will re um, require some sort of codex to take them from audio into a digital format and then uh, back to audio at the transmitter site. Um, that it helps uh, maintain the integrity of the, um, the signal um, since it's a lot easier to reduce noise in a digital signal than it is an audio signal. Um, do you have any thoughts about that, Donna? Uh, yeah, it it is definitely becoming um, a smarter way to do it, uh, and much much less expensive. I'm sitting here looking at uh, an STL package with a 10 watt transmitter, and they want three thousand dollars for it. Um, so, the what you want to look for is um, uh, Something along the line of um, an ISP uh, over the over the internet um, connection STL. Uh, usually, that's done with a shot uh, from your studio to your uh, your transmitter, um, and that's usually done by a line of sight. And it can be done by microwave. It can be done by Wi-Fi. Um, but again, it, it depends on a case by case basis. Uh, if it's right off your building, you just hardwire right out, and you don't need an STO at that point. Thank you. So we're just at uh, just at seven, so we're going to take two more questions that we have here. Um, the first one I noticed is about remote broadcasting. Um, if you folks want to answer some questions about uh, the equipment that you need for remote broadcasting, and then uh, we'll take one more after that I see here. What do you mean by remote broadcasting? Um, I think I assume that the question means um, if you're doing like a remote broadcast, um, you know, somewhere in say around 
in, you know, in town around the radio station, um, and you're beam, trying to beam back sound, uh, you broadcast from a, like, you know, a remote to the station back onto the air. Um, you know, I think if you're, that, it's not so hard to, there are um, applications um, that you can use, and you can actually use the same kind of web streaming uh, programs. Um, if you're connected to the internet at a location to stream um, audio back to your, um, your uh, uh, main studio, um, there's also, uh, you can also get um, analog uh, equipment that you can get a separate license for from the FCC. Um, that is on, um, you know, either microwave or, or some um, higher frequency band um, that are uh, for uh, remote broadcasts. Right. Now, there's also in remote broadcast is the other part of the controlling of the signal, which is generally uh, in your in your software. Uh, depending on the type of transmitter that you have. So your chief engineer would be able to remain in touch 24-7 um, with the transmitter. Uh, and if anything should go wrong, uh, they'd be able to fix it from their phone, um, you know, while they're anywhere in the world, basically. So so there's that's a two-pronged thing when you say remote broadcast. Indeed. Um, another, this other question I wanted to answer was the, the one about the transmitter exciter being kept in the studio or the transmitter location. So at the, the yeah, yeah. Um, I was just going to say that the, the transmitter exciter is actually also the transmitter, um, mm -hmm. and especially in this in low power situations, the transmitter exciter usually is the thing that um, uh, takes this audio and turns it into an FM signal. And then often for, for higher power situations, that, that, uh, that uh, signal after the exciter will be put into another transmitter that just amplifies that signal. So um, the kind of, of, of uh, transmitter that you're likely to use, um, unless it's a really old one uh, for, for LPFM, um, is going to be a transmission exciter, the transmitter, you know, an exciter and the transmitter all in one, um, because right. that's that tends to be the way it's done. Right. And there's um, Bex XT30, which is a 30 watt FM exciter and transmitter um, that uh, you can have tuned. Again, this this takes a few weeks. Your transmitters, when you order your transmitters, it's going to take a couple weeks um, for it to come in because it needs to be tuned and tested before they ship it out. And then once it gets um, to your, your project um, and gets set up, it also needs to be tuned and tested. Well, not tuned, but tested yet again when it's mounted. Um, that's, uh, that's where you get your proof of performance to ensure that everything is operating within the legal limits that was granted to your station. Great. Uh, thanks, Donna. So folks, we're going to just wrap it up here since we're past 7 o'clock now, but uh, 7 o'clock where we are, 7 o'clock Eastern time, I should say. I know some of you are joining us in places where it is not currently 7 o'clock, but, um, but since we're past the hour here. So uh, I just want to say thank you to everyone for joining us tonight. So much thanks to Donna and Will for their expertise. It's been great to hear um, really clear point by point going through all the pieces that we'll need. Uh, reminder, of course, that, uh, that these documents are available on the Prometheus site, so both the um, low power equipment guide to look at and that includes those budgets that you saw uh, Will bring up and then uh, all of the information about um, internet streaming is also on the site, so you can just um, go to the Prometheus site, use that as a resource to, to connect to those things. You can also always uh, get in touch with applicant support about your applications in general. That's support at prometheusradio.org. And, uh, and also when I uh, post this webinar, the recording of it, 
we can also put those um, those resources up there so they're easy to find, just uh, linked up with the webinar if that's how you found them. Um, so um, thanks again. Uh, Donna, if you have any closing remarks, feel free or we can, um, we can just uh, close up the webinar for the evening. Well, I want to thank everybody for joining us on the webinar. And if uh, I can be of any help, please do not hesitate to contact me at Community Radio Goddess at yahoo.com. Great. Um, very fitting. We need more. This is what we're going to need to get a lot of stations. No, we can need all people power, but of course, the Community Radio Goddess definitely would help us get a, get a station going. And I'll just put that um, email in the chat box so that people can get a hold of that. So, Will, do you have closing remarks or uh, any way people can get a hold of you? Or uh, I told folks to get to uh, to check out just support at prometheusradio.org. Do you have any closing remarks you want to give people? Um, just thanks for attending. And um, yeah, I'm available for, uh, you know, you can call Prometheus or email us. Um, and you can ask for me and I'll help you out. Awesome. So thanks again to our presenters. That was great. Thanks to everyone for joining us tonight. And uh, of course, keep an eye on the upcoming webinars at um, prometheusradio.org slash webinars. And I uh, hope everyone has a great evening. Thanks a lot. Take care. <laughs>